Hi, this is a recording to accompany the slides for the second out of three lectures on the digestive system. So let's begin. This um, slide gives you an overview of the major organs that are involved in, digest in digestion. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the major digestive organs. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about accessory organs as well as the overall process of digestion and absorption. So let's begin from the top, from the mouth. So the mouth is sometimes called the oral or buccal cavity, and it's got associated, um, it's, it's got salivary glands associated with it. When we put food in our mouth, it, we chew it in a process called mastication, and we mix it with saliva that's produced by the salivary glands to form a bolus, a rounded mass of food that can be easily swallowed. So another term for swallow is deglutition. In terms of the amount of saliva that's produced in a day, we usually produce about a liter a day. And the uh, saliva is produced um, autonom uh, automatically through reflex mechanisms when we think, see, smell, taste food. In terms of the composition of saliva, you can see here that it's mainly made out of water with a little bit of mucus. We've got two enzymes over here, amylase that digest starch, starches, carbohydrates, and lipase that helps to digest lipids. In the saliva, we've also got sodium bicarbonate and phosphate ions that help to um, act as a buffer, as well as to increase the pH so that amylase can work um, effectively. There's also um, a couple of things, uh, immunoglobulin A as well as lysosomes that help to inactivate bacteria that um, comes um, as part of our food. So you can see over here, we've got salivary glands over here and they help to produce saliva, which then moistens the food um, when we're actually chewing it to mix it so that we can swallow it easily. When we swallow, it moves from the um, mouth to the pharynx, to the throat, and there you've got here, you've got the three different parts of the pharynx. The nasopharynx, that's the um, proximal part that's associated with um, the um, um, transport of air from the external, between the external environment and the lungs. And then the distal two parts, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx um, is involved in transport of air as well as um, food and drink that we swallow, right? So you can see over here, the nasopharynx is only part of the respiratory system, whereas the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx are part of both respiratory and digestive um, systems. The oropharynx is connected to the mouth, hence the word oro, right? Oro refers to mouth. And the laryngopharynx, laryngeal refers to the larynx, which is the next part of the respiratory tract, right? So what happens is air comes in through the nose into the nasopharynx, goes down, um, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and then down into the larynx and the trachea, whereas food goes in through the mouth, and then in through the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx, and then down the esophagus. When we swallow, three things occur at the same time simultaneously. So when we swallow, what happens is that um, the soft palate and the uvula, which is at the back of the throat, um, rise reflective, uh, reflexively, so they go up to close off the entrance to the nasopharynx. So when we swallow, what happens is because this entrance to the nasopharynx is closed off, then food and drink automatically move into the oropharynx towards the laryngopharynx. The other thing that happens is the skeletal muscle, muscles of the pharynx contract Right, and they're called elevator skeletal muscle of the pharynx, which then raises the rest of the pharynx so that the bolus of food can go into it easily. The third thing that occurs is this larynx, this part of the respiratory tract is pulled superiorly, so moves up, and the epiglottis, which is over here, basically covers the opening or the glottis 
of the opening to the larynx. So the opening of the larynx is called the glottis. So the epiglottis covers it so that again, food goes from the mouth into the oropharynx, down the laryngeal pharynx. And because the epiglottis closes the entrance to the larynx, then food and drink moves into the esophagus, right? Immediately after, uh, after swallowing, then what happens is that the uh, elevator skeletal muscle of the pharynx relax and the constrictor pharyngeal muscles um, contract to actually push the bolus of food down the esophagus, right? And that action also um, initiates peristalsis, which is the rhythmic uh, contraction and relaxation of the um, smooth muscle of the digestive tract so that the bolus of ingested contents move down it. Now, the other thing is that both the pharynx and the esophagus are just involved in peristalsis. They're not involved in any digestive processes, so they don't do any chemical or mechanical digestion, and they're not involved in absorption. So basically, the food that is swallowed from the mouth enters into the stomach as is, because what happens is the pharynx and the esophagus are just involved in transport. It's just a tube, because when you see where the esophagus is located, this is located in within, um, part of the esophagus is within the thoracic cavity, where the um, heart and the lungs are located. So basically, the esophagus is just a tube to actually transport food down from the mouth to the stomach. In terms of swallowing, there are three phases of swallowing. So the oral or mouth phase, the phase where the food um, goes through the pharynx, and the phase where the food goes through the esophagus, right? So deglutition involves moving the food from the mouth to the stomach, as I said, without any chemical or mechanical digestion and without any absorption taking place. So in the oral part of the deglutition process, both the bolus of food moves from the mouth to the oropharynx over here. And so what happens is that act of swallowing is voluntarily controlled. The pharyngeal phase of deglutition is where it moves from the oropharynx to the esophagus. This is not voluntarily controlled. Right, so what happens is then the uvula and the soft palate moves up, closes off the nasopharynx, and then the um, the bolus of food then uh, moves down there past the um, laryngeal opening, the glottis, because it's closed off by the epiglottis, and then it enters into the esophagus. The third part of deglutition is called the esophageal stage. And again, it's also not controlled voluntarily. And in the esophageal uh, stage, the bolus of food moves from the esophagus into the stomach, right? And so what happens is you've got a series of involuntarily controlled peristaltic movements to actually push the uh, bolus of food um, down along the uh, esophagus into the stomach. And when it reaches the um, part of the esophagus that connects with the stomach, you've got the lower esophageal sphincter that needs to relax in order for it to open and for the bolus of food to actually move down into the stomach, right? So again, this is just um, an overview of what the uh, esophagus is. It's a hollow tube for transport. It's got stratified squamous epithelium with goblet cells that secretes only mucus, and the mucus is just there to help lubricate the bolus of food as it moves down the esophagus. The esophagus goes through the diaphragm, through the esophageal uh, hiatus, so the diaphragm is right over here, right? And there's an opening where the esophagus goes through called the esophageal um, hiatus. In terms of the section of the esophagus, you've got the cervical portion short in the neck, you've got the thoracic portion in the thoracic cavity, and then you've got the abdominal portion within the abdominal cavity, right? So the three different portions are exactly where you think it would be based on the name. The cervical portion includes the upper esophageal sphincter, 
And so again, you can see there's two esophageal sphincters, upper and lower. And again, just by the name, you can see where they are located. So the upper esophageal sphincter is located between the uh, esophagus and the pharynx. So it separates the esophagus from the, from the pharynx. And while the lower esophageal sphincter separates the esophagus from the um, stomach. The lower esophageal sphincter is sometimes also referred to as cardiac sphincter, although it's um, that's um, a fairly uh, dated term, so you may not even hear of that. Um, and the uh, the purpose of the um, lower esophageal sphincter, as much as it is to control the bolus of food moving into the stomach, um, as I said before, a lot of the sphincters in the uh, in in the body that is uh, made of the smooth muscle are tonically closed, are tonically con constricted. So they are um, closed unless something happens to actually momentarily open them. So the lower esophageal sphincter is um, usually closed, and it opens only when food goes down it. But it also is closed in order to stop the acidic content of the stomach from going back up into the esophagus because the stomach is designed for the uh, low um, pH of gastric acid, whereas the esophagus is not. Another thing about the esophagus is it's uh, lined with stratified squamous epithelium, stratified because the bolus that we swallow is still fairly rough, and so it does have some wear and tear on the, esoph uh, on, on the ep esophageal epithelium, so you've got lots of layers to actually uh, cope with that, as well as goblet cells that produce mucus to help to lubricate the passage of food as it goes down into the stomach, which leads us to the stomach. So the size of the stomach varies um, according to factors such as gender and how much is in, in, in it. When it's empty, it's the size of a close, fit, uh, close fist, just like the heart and, and the kidney. When it's full, it can hold up to four liters, which is a huge amount. Location of the stomach is in between the esophagus and the intestines. So the esophagus is uh, um, aboral, so on the oral side of the stomach, and the uh, small intestine is on the anal um, side um, of, of the stomach, right? So you've got the stomach here, esophagus, and then you've got the small intestine. The stomach fits underneath the um, um, diaphragm. So the diaphragm is over here. You can see it's under the diaphragm and the liver. This is the liver over here. And when we breathe, what happens is our diaphragm moves up and down. And so the stomach also moves up and down together with that. Features of the stomach are that it's got the lower esophageal sphincter here, separating the stomach from the esophagus. It's got the pyloric sphincter over here, separating the stomach from the small intestine. And what you can see here is because the stomach is a three-dimensional organ, it's not a tube like the rest of the um, digestive tract. It's got a third layer of smooth muscle to actually help it to mix the gastric uh, contents well, right? So it's got circular muscle, it's got longitudinal muscle, and then it's got a third muscle that is there at an, at an angle. In the mucosa and submucosa, we've got rouge. So rouge are like flexible folds that gets extended when the stomach that gets stretched when the stomach is full and it contains gastric pits with gastric glands at the base of the pits. So we're going to look at that in the next slide, next couple of slides. In terms of the functions of the stomach, as I said, it can hold up to um, four liters. And so it's a reservoir or a container of food. And what happens is when you have the stomach over here, you have the small intestine right there. What happens is whatever we digest is contained in the stomach and released into the small intestine in controlled 
um, amounts, right? So if you look at how much um, digested contents goes from the stomach to the small intestine, you can see over here, three to five mils, that's barely a teaspoon every 20 seconds, right? So it's barely a, um, a tablespoon every minute. And so that's why it, when you feel full, what happens is it's because gastric emptying takes a long time, two to six hours after we, f we, um, we finish a meal, right? And so in terms of the mechanical movement, what happens is the, the stomach will contract in order to actually mix the uh, ingested, mix, mix the bolus together with the digestive juices and to break down the, um, the ingested food, uh, both chemically and mechanically, right? In terms of chemical di di digestion, we've got different um, enzymes that, um, sorry, uh, so salivary amylase is inactivated by the, uh, by the um, gastric acid, but the gastric acid activates a different enzyme called pepsin that helps to break down proteins, right? We've also got lipase that's uh, secreted by the stomach called gastric lipase as opposed to lingual lipase that's secreted by in, in the mouth. So gastric lipase continues uh, lipid digestion. There's also intrinsic factor that's released by parietal cells and that binds to vitamin B12 so that the, um, the intrinsic factor vitamin B12 complex can be absorbed in the intestine. And vitamin B12 is important for red blood cell production. As it says over here, different types of food takes different amounts of time to process. Um, so if you eat half a loaf of bread, it will um, cause the stomach to empty much faster than if you eat a liter of um, full fat ice cream. In terms of control of gastric digestion, um, it's balanced by a uh, hormonal as well as a nervous control, right? So we've got several different hormones that are released um, that help to control the long-term um, overview of uh, gastric digestion through the release of gastric inhibitory peptide and gastrin. And we've also got the nervous control um, through the parasympathetic nervous system that stimulates um, um, gastric motility and the sympathetic uh, nervous system that inhibits um, uh, digestion. Um, and we've got also got chemoreceptors as well as mechanoreceptors to actually help to coordinate the whole thing. So the mechanoreceptors register the amount of stretch, how full the stomach is. The chemoreceptors are taste buds that help to differentiate between um, when you eat carbs or fats or proteins or what have you. And so um, depending on what kind of nutrients end up in the stomach will determine what kind of um, um, juices and enzymes are released. In terms of the secretions that the stomach produces, we've got a large number of gastric pits and a gastric pit is exactly like it sounds. It's a pit, right? So you see over here, that's a gastric pit here, that's a gastric pit here, that's a gastric pit there. And when we look at the pits, what we can see is we can see a variety of different um, cells, right? So you've got the gastric gland in the bottom of the pit and you can see the gastric glands um, are um, made out of mucus and neck cells that produce uh, mucus, alkaline mucus. We've got chief cells over here that produce um, pepsin and other enzymes and actually chief cells produce the inactive version of pepsin called pepsinogen. And what happens is that parietal cells produce the intrinsic factor that binds to vitamin B12, and it also produces um, hydrochloric acid. And so what happens is that pepsinogen is activated by hydrochloric acid to form pepsin, which is the active form of the enzyme, and that helps to digest proteins. 
And we also have enteroendocrine cells. Again, when you look at the name, entero refers to the digestive tract, endocrine refers to hormones. And so the enteroendocrine cells of the stomach produces the uh, hormone gastrin as well as other hormones as well. So as I said, the stomach produces hydrochloric acid and hydrochloric acid is very acidic. So um, it means that the stomach uh, pH is anywhere between pH of one to pH of four, right? pH four is still very acidic. And so what happens is the stomach needs to protect itself because if not, the hydrochloric acid will eat away at the stomach, right? At the stomach lining, at the stomach muscles, at the stomach. And the way that it does um, protect itself from autodigestion or, or, or self-digestion is that the mucus neck cells in the stomach produce alkaline mucus. And what happens is that the alkaline mucus helps to coat the epithelium of the stomach. And so what happens is that the hydrochloric acid can act on the inside of the stomach, but it gets neutralized as it tries to make its way into the epithelium of the stomach. So that's one thing. The other, the other strategy that the stomach has to protect itself, it's it's got tight junctions between the cells, between the endothelial cells of the epithelial cells of the stomach. And so it means that hydrochloric acid, it's har much harder for it to actually go through because of the tight junctions. The third strategy for the stomach to protect itself is that the epithelium cell over here are replaced very frequently. So every three to six days, what happens is the epithelium cells in the mucosa lining of the stomach are replaced. And so if it gets damaged through hydrochloric acid, it gets replaced, right? So you have a fresh epithelial um, lining of the stomach every um, three days or so to help to withstand the, um, the um, effects of hydrochloric acid. In terms of chemical digestion of the, uh, of the stomach, we've got a few different things. So the first one is gastric juices. So gastric juices, as it says here, juice is watery. So it contains uh, water and alkaline mucus. We talked about how alkaline mucus lines the epithelium of the stomach. Um, so it helps to lubricate the stomach contents to protect it against the hydrochloric acid and to facilitate mixing of the chyme, the ingested uh, material with the gastric juices. We also talked about intrinsic factor that's released by parietal cells. So it binds to vitamin B12, protects vitamin B12 from being digested in the stomach and helps the vitamin B12 to move as a complex with intrinsic factor into the a small intestine when it, where it gets um, absorbed. Hydrochloric acid is produced by the parietal cells, brings the pH of the stomach environment to, any, to a very, very low uh, level. So, you know, de depending on which uh, um, textbook or which source you, um, you look at, it brings the stomach um, pH down to anywhere from one to four, one and a half to three, anyway, very acidic. One of the purposes of the hydrochloric acid is it causes denaturation of protein. So if you look over here, this is a normal protein with a normal 3D shape and normal function. Denaturation makes the protein lose its secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. So all that's really, uh, all that remains is the primary structure. And remember, the primary structure is when amino acid one is connected to amino acid two, connected to three, connected to four, connected to five, and so on and so forth. So it makes the uh, protein into a string. And what happens is once it gets made into a string, then different enzymes can cut it up much easily, right? It's much easier to, to uh, cut a single strand of a rope rather than a thick multi-stranded rope. The other purpose of hydrochloric acid is it destroys, um, kills bacteria, which we swallow with food. And it also converts pepsinogen, which is the inactive version, into pepsin. 
and then pepsin then um, helps to digest to break to chemically break down the denatured protein. All right, so again, pepsin, as you see, only works in an acidic environment. So pepsin only works in the stomach. Once the contents go into the small intestine, it stops working. The other thing to, to look at this, um, this graph here is that amylase that's produced by the saliva is only active at much higher pH. So when you can see here, amylase, the activity of amylase is not very much when it gets into the gastric, um, acidic gastric environment, right? So it works in the uh, mouth where the um, pH is more basic, but not in the stomach when the pH is uh, more acidic. Trypsin is an enzyme that is active in the small intestine. And again, when you look at the pH that trypsin is active in, it's not active at all in the stomach, right? So this is the stomach. And this is the small intestine, the mouth, right? And the large intestine. So you can see over here that these enzymes will work in environments other than the acidic stomach. Last um, chemical that um, on the slide is gastrin, which is a hormone that's released by G cells. Very easy to remember. And gastrin stimulates um, gastric activity. So gas, when gastrin is released, it helps, um, uh, it helps the activity of the stomach to actually um, increase it, right? So when you see over here, it increases secretion by the gastric uh, glands, promotes um, gastric emptying, so food moving from the stomach or chyme moving from the stomach to the small intestine. Once it's in the small intestine, it promotes small intestinal um, muscle contraction triggers mass movements in the large intestine. So basically what it does is gastrin also causes us to want to um, get rid of the undigested and unabsorbed uh, substances in our large intestine to make way for new food that we've eaten, right? So gastrin is released when peptides and amino acids are present in the stomach. The other um, chemical that's released is histamine. Histamine um, stimulates uh, parietal cells of the stomach to release um, um, gastric acid or hydrochloric acid, again, released when peptides and amino acids are present in the stomach. Serotonin or 5-HT increases gastric motility, um, inhibits gastric acid secretion. Ghrelin regulates food intake and somatostatin restricts all gastric secretions. So it works, um, uh, it, it basically slows down um, uh, gastric uh, activity. So you can see here, there's a balance of things that stimulate gastric activity and other things that inhibit gastric activity. So these are not all released at the same time, but the balance of the release of all of this helps to keep um, the digestive system uh, working effectively and efficiently. In terms of the phases of gastric secretion, you've got here the three different phases. The first one is the cephalic or reflex phase. This is very, very short. And the cephalic phase, um, so these three phases are involved in triggering secretion of um, gastric secretions right? So the cephalic phrase is very brief. We can trigger a, um, a short burst of gastric secretion just by thinking, tasting, smelling food. This is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's vagal vagal. So it goes up to the brain through the vagus nerves and goes down to the stomach um, through the vagus nerve again. And the cephalic phase basically, um, makes the stomach ready to actually accept food. So it increases salivation, it starts um, gastric acid secretion as well as gastrin secretion. So it helps to prep the stomach. The next phase is a gastric phase. And the gastric phase is started when food basically, when food starts to enter the stomach, right? So the stimulus is the basic pH of the saliva as well as food entering into the stomach. 
And this gastric phase is again controlled by the nervous system through the parasympathetic nervous system, as well as the release of gastrin, gastrin, the hormone gastrin. And in the gastric phase, what happens is HCL is secreted, gastric juices are secreted, gastric enzymes are secreted, as well as gastrin. And what it does is it in, in, ensures that gastric, um, the digestive process in, in, in the stomach are stimulated. So you've got um, a lot of contractions and a lot of secretions in the stomach to help to mechanically and chemically digest the food that's there, right? So you see over here, you've got, um, you've got the uh, um, things that stimulate stomach secretory activity and then you've got um, other factors that inhibit it. So you've got emotional distress or you're, um, you're exercising or running away from the bear, then the sympathetic nervous system kicks in to actually inhibit the um, gastric phase of gastric secretion. The third phase is the intestinal phase. And the intestinal phase starts when um, the, di the, the chyme moves from the stomach into the first part of the, of the small intestine, the duodenum. And so this is called the entero. In this case, entero refers to intestine, enterogastric reflex. So it's a reflex between the stomach and the small intestine. So what happens is that when food starts entering into the small intestine, you've got the parasympathetic nervous system coordinating it as well as um, various hormones, right? Gastric inhibitory uh, peptide to actually slow down the movement of food from the stomach to the small intestine. Um, and, um, and the reason for that, you want to slow down the movement of food from the stomach or digestive chyme from the stomach to the intestine in order to give the best chance of absorption of, of final uh, digestion as well as absorption, right? If food moves through the small intestine too quickly, then there won't be enough time for absorption of the nutrients to occur. And then basically we end up with diarrhea right because food moves way too quickly next part of the digestive tract is the small intestine so what we have over here is we have the stomach over here in between the stomach and the small intestine we've got the pyloric sphincter in between the small intestine and the large intestine we've got the ileocecal valve or sphincter as you can see here the small intestine is divided into three unequal portions First portion closest to the stomach is called the duodenum, and this is where the final uh, chemical digestion process, uh, process takes place. And then we've got the jejunum and the ileum are the second and third parts as we move distally. And the jejunum and the ileum is where most absorption takes place. The small intestine is involved for 90% of all nutrient absorption. And so what we want is we want the nutrients to stay in the small intestine for as long as possible to maximize um, absorption. Openings into the duodenum are the hepatopancreatic ampulla, which mixes um, bile with pancreatic juices. Um, and you've got the hepatopancreatic sphincter and they're right over here, six and seven, that actually allows the, um, the uh, bile and pancreatic juices to actually enter into the duodenum. There is also an accessory duct that I'll put in right over here. And the accessory duct um, transports pancreatic juices with their enzymes directly into the small uh, directly into the duodenum without actually mixing with bile. And we'll talk about the whole thing when we uh, go to the next lecture, which talks about the pancreas, the, uh, the liver, as well as the uh, gallbladder, which are all uh, accessory organs. This sphincter right over here, the ileocecal uh, sphincter, is controlled by both hormones and the nervous system. So you can see over here, you've got the gastroileal reflex. When the food enters into the stomach, 
it increases the force of segmentation or mixing in the last part of the small intestine in the ileum. Um, and what happens is that gastrin also increases the activity of the ileum and relaxes the ileocecal uh, sphincter to move the unabsorbed contents into the large intestine. And then when um, the contents move into the cecum, the first part of the large intestine, then the back pressure helps to close the ileocecal valve. Right. So as I said, the small intestine is involved in final chemical digestion as well as absorption. 90% of uh, um, nutrients are absorbed in the small uh, intestine. In order for this to happen, there are some unique features of the small intestine, which we'll cover over here. So the first one is circular folds. And I haven't actually found a good picture that depicts it. And what happens is a circular fold are deep ridges. So imagine this, as a kid, we've all gone down slides, right? So some slides are just straight down and you go woo all the way down. And we've also gone down spiral slides, right? And so if we have these two slides, which are the same height off the ground, when you go down a straight slide, you go down much faster. Whereas if you go down a spiral slide, it'll take a longer time for you to make your way down the spirals, right? Circular folds work the same way as a spiral slide. So because it takes time to go down the deep ridges of the small intestine, then it slows down the movement of chyme through the small intestine, and it increases the chances of final digestion occurring, as well as the chances of absorption occurring as well. Another feature of the small intestine are villi. So you've got here, you've got this. Projections are called villi. In the villi, you've got um, um, capillaries. So you've got blood capillaries, right, with um, arterioles. Uh, so blood goes from the arterioles into the blood capillaries out through the uh, venules. And you've also got these uh, lymphatic capillaries. And in the digestive tract, the lymphatic capillaries are called lacteals. And so all nutrients, when it moves from the uh, lumen of the small intestine, it goes from here into either the blood capillaries or the lymphatic capillaries, right? In the villi, the uh, epithelium is simple, one layer thick epithelium to allow for rapid and easy absorption. The villi is also in increase um, surface area. So instead of it being instead of it being flat, what happens is you've got this, right? Instead of just being flat. And again, that increases the surface area for contact for final digestion and absorption to occur. Now on the villi, we have this microvilli. So I always think of the microvilli as the bristles of a, a circular brush, hairbrush, right? So you've got those microvilli. And so what happens is the microvilli is sometimes called the brush border. And what happens is again, they increase surface area, but they also have enzymes in the microvilli called brush, brush border enzymes that help to do the final chemical digestion as the nutrients are being absorbed from the lumen in through the epithelial um, cell to enter into either the blood capillaries or the lymphatic capillaries. In the small intestine, we've also got glands or crypts, pits, um, and these glands contain enterocytes, so cells of the small intestine, it contains stem cells, it contains goblet cells, it contains cells that release um, hormones, um, and 
like all stem cells, they divide at a high rate to replace cells. The enterocytes are the main cells of the um, small intestine. So they're the ones that produce secretions, that produce enzymes, that produce bicarbonate to increase pH to neutralize the gastric acidic chyme. Um, goblet cells produce mucus and water, and the entero and endocrine cells uh, produce hormones that are released into the systemic circulation to coordinate and to control the overall digestive processes. In terms of the movement or motility in the um, in the small intestine, we've got um, peristalsis as usual. So peristalsis is the movement of food from the mouth to the anus. So it's sometimes called ab oral movement or anal movement and um, and we've got mixing as well. So as well as peristalsis, we've got the migrating motility complex um, that occurs throughout the small intestine. So they help to move the chyme through the intestine over a five hour period, right? So it's over a sustained uh, period when there's um, chyme in the um, in the small intestine. So what happens is that the migrating motility complexes is stimulated when there is a bolus of food within the small intestine, secretes the ho hormones uh, motilin and cholecystokinin, which initiates this migrating motility complexes. There's also mixing. Um, in, that happens in the small intestine and in the small intestine it's called segmentation and so what you can see here is segmentation helps to thoroughly mix the digestive contents with secretions right so the chyme that enters from the stomach is mixed in with juices from the pancreas juices from juices from the liver and gallbladder as well as juices from the intestinal mucosa for final digestion and then it also helps to bring digestive, um, uh, digested material in contact with the mucosa of the intestine in order for absorption to occur, right? So again, segmentation is triggered when a portion of the small intestine is uh, distended, so has a bolus of chyme in it, and it triggers this mixing in order to do the final chemical digestion and to increase absorption. When we move to the large intestine from the small intestine, what you can see here is that there are several different divisions of the large intestine. So the first division is the cecum, right? The cecum is where you have the ileocecal valve, right? The ileum is the last part of the small intestine. And what you can see here is right here at the start of the cecum, you've got the appendix and they call it the vermiform appendix because vermiform, it looks like a, a worm. Um, and so the appendix contains lymphoid um, tissue. Um, we think it's a reservoir for gut bacteria that's beneficial. In terms of the other parts of the uh, intestine, you've got the part the large intestine, you've got the part that goes up called the ascending colon. And the, and the movement here is based on the movement of, of um, the contents, right? So food goes, or undigested, unabsorbed food or contents goes from the ileum to the cecum, goes up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, and then down the descending colon. And then over here, it curves around to the sigmoid colon where it then meets the rectum and then the anus, right? In terms of the uh, sphincters that are found within the large intestine, we've got the ileocecal sphincter that controls the movement of contents from the uh, between the small intestine and the large intestine and then we've got the two anal sphincters um, at the end of the anus so you've got the internal anal sphincter that is made out of circ uh, smooth muscle circular smooth muscle always closed um, automatically 
And then we've got the outer external um, skeletal muscle sphincter, which is um, involved in voluntary control. So when we're actually wanting to defecate, the control moves from the involuntary smooth internal anal sphincter to the external voluntarily controlled anal sphincter made out of skeletal muscle. In terms of the unique features that are found in the large intestine, we've got the tenia coli, which is the um, triple band of smooth muscle that are present throughout here. Can just barely see, see it. And then you've got the haustra, which are um, smooth, uh, which are a series of um, pouches. And then you've got the epiploic append appendages, which um, contain um, fat, right? Small fat filled sacs um, of the visceral uh, peritoneum that are uh, attached to the tenia coli. In terms of the structure of the small intestine, we've got uh, bacteria that are beneficial to our gut um, that is really, uh, linked to, as it says here, increased immune uh, response facilitate the chemical digestion process that occurs in the large intestine and also helps to synthesize um, bacteria. We've got enterocytes, cells of the intestine that absorb water, right? So you can see here for every two cups of, of fluid that enters into the cecum, the first part of the small intestine, over a cup is absorbed. Right? We've also got goblet cells, which function the way goblet cells do all over the body, produces mucus. And in this part, the mucus helps to aid in the movement of um, fecal as it's, as it's being um, produced throughout the large intestine. Um, there are no circular folds, no villi found in the large intestine. Um, and there are few um, enzyme secreting cells over here. In terms of the epithelium, where it is um, the first part where it's involved in absorption of water, you've got simple squamous epithelium, where it becomes a little bit um, less, um, well, the fecal matter becomes more solid, you've got stratified squamous epithelium in order to avoid the wear and tear as, as uh, um, feces is being produced and as it becomes harder, right? So you can see over here, when you look at the different terms here, what you can see here is as, as um, the contents enter from the, um, from the small intestine, it enters as fluid, and because water is absorbed, it changes from fluid to semi-fluid, to mush, to semi-mush, to semi-solid, to solid. Right, and that's all because you've got water being absorbed as the contents make its way through the um, small intestine. When motility moves slowly, what happens is more water is absorbed and so the fecal matter becomes harder and it can cause constipation. Where motility or the movement is fast, it actually then moves through the small intestine very a lot quicker. And because it moves through the small intestine a lot quicker, there's not enough time for water absorption to occur. And then it can cause loose feces or diarrhea. So you see over here, uh, primary functions of the large intestine to complete the absorption of nutrients and water. So as I said, 90% of nutrient absorption occurs in the small intestine. The other 10% is split between the large intestine and the stomach, right? Um, mechanical digestion um, occurs through the contraction of the haustra as well as uh, peristalsis, where you've got some segmentation occurring as well. And then what happens is you also have mass movements where waves that start at the transverse colon over here helps to move contents down to the ascending, the sigmoid colon, and then the rectum, right? Sometimes it's triggered 
um, through uh, us eating or immediately afterwards, and it's activated by the gastrocolic. So gastro refers to the stomach, colic refers to the colon, right? Um, in terms of chemical digestion, again, not very many enzymes there, and so a lot of the chemical digestion that occurs in the large intestine is due to the presence of bacteria. So it's bacterial digestion, and because um, bacteria then digest the remaining um, carbs that are in the large intestine, it can cause gas and cause uh, um, us to, to fart. Last part is elimination or defecation when fecal matter leaves our digestive tract. And so what we have is um, usually our rectum is empty, right? So that's why when we fart, we don't actually, um, there's no uh, fecal matter that leaves our system because the rectum is, is empty. Um, and so what happens is control of defecation is partly under voluntary control, partly reflex, which is stimulated by rectal dis dis um, distension. So as it says here, most of the time the rectum is empty with minimal stretching because it's empty. And what happens is that the internal smooth muscle sphincter is contracted normally and the external skeletal muscle sphincter is um, relaxed and open. So it's under involuntary control. When mass peristalsis happens, um, the, the contents move from the transverse colon down the descending and sigmoid column into the rectum. And that movement of contents into the rectum stretches the rectum, activates stretch receptors, which triggers the internal sphincter to relax and the external sphincter to contract. And so it moves from an involuntary control to a voluntary control. And then what happens is we need to make a conscious decision to relax our external anal sphincter in order for defecation to, to occur, right? If a person involuntarily inhibits defecation, um, what happens is the rectal receptors become depressed, urge to defecate doesn't come again until hours later when mass peritalsis takes place again, right? So again, it's under voluntary control. Um, and again, with voluntary control, we we'll obviously need to actually ensure that we've got a suitable place for defecation to occur. And on that note,